Hello all, everyone. We have uh, an exciting new story. Our latest one coming from Tripping Over the Lunch Lady. This one is written by Rachel Vale, and it is entitled The Lunch. Walking down to lunch, she was next to me, Gabriela Gonzalez. She comes up to my armpit. I have known her since second grade and always noticed her, but never talked to her. Never before today, even. She has a really sweet smile. As we were walking along, past the boiler room, and then past the gym, I was thinking, this is the time to say something to her. Right now. I had a good thing to say, too. I was thinking I could say, Gabriella, I really liked your dust mite feces report today. Some people kept going, ew, and stuff like that while Gabriella was giving her presentation, but I thought it was really interesting. I will never look at the dust the same way again. Dust won't be just little puffs of fluff to me now. It will be little puffs of fluff with a lot of tiny bug poops in it. That is how good her presentation was this morning. I wanted to tell her all that. I couldn't. No words came out. Gabriella is tiny, but she was walking very quickly, chatting with her friends as they skittered toward the cafeteria. I sat down at the other end of the table. People got quiet as I unzipped my lunchbox. I am famous for my lunches. I make them myself, because it's like an interest of mine, a hobby. And besides, my mom used to rush it. Just slap some meat on bread, a can of soda thrown crushingly on top. It's not her fault. She has enough to do, and she's one of those people who don't care that much about food. I make mom's lunch sometimes, too, whenever she wants. Otherwise, she just has a yogurt and a banana for her whole meal. And the people in her office are always impressed with what she takes those days. At least that's what my mom says. But she's like that. Complimentary. She calls me a sandwich specialist. Gabriella, on the other hand, takes the same thing every day. Two slices of turkey on white bread. No press. Probably mayonnaise. Hard to tell with all that white. And she has either cut up carrots or cut up red peppers in a plastic bag, an apple juice box, and one vanilla wafer cookie. For me, her whole lunch would be an appetizer. I pulled my sandwich from the bag. Some of the guys were getting impatient. Dave Calderon started to tear my tinfoil. I held up my hand. He calmed down. I unwrapped the tinfoil myself. Ooh, one of the girls from the other end said. I'm pretty sure, unfortunately, that it was not Gabriella. She has sort of a squeaky voice, and this one was deeper. Pumpernickel, I explained. Mike Shimizo nodded. He makes his own lunch, too, takes it as seriously as I do, and he's my best friend. But he is sort of a runty guy, real small, so he just can't eat all that much. But he does like interesting food, and you gotta give him that. I held up the sandwich so everybody could see. Tell us, Dave said. I told them. Mesquite wood smoked turkey, aged sharp Adirondack cheddar, one piece. De-seeded cucumbers, sliced grape tomatoes, one roasted red pepper, marinated in olive oil and capers overnight, cracked black pepper, and Dijon mustard. Some kids said, mmm. Gabriella's best friend Lulu said, wow. Mike nodded again. Unbelievable, he said. The pepper. Yeah, I said. I've been working with the balance. Last week I overdid it on the capers. No, said Mike. The cracked black pepper. That's exactly right. It needs that for bite. I wouldn't have thought of the cracked black pepper. Mike looked sadly down at his spread. He'd done an old favorite. Poached salmon on seven grain with tomato. Which was delicious, of course, but he had brought it last Monday, too. We both nodded. I opened my club soda and took a big swig, then started to eat. The balance on the marinade was definitely much better than last week's. Sorry, speaking of club soda, that's what I've got behind me here. I make my own club soda at home. Point that out if you're wondering what that was. I finished before Mike, but waited for him before we went out to the lower playground. It's basically a parking lot without cars and a few basketball hoops without nets, but it's perfect for us. We don't need swings and slides and all that anymore. Just a good open stretch of concrete with a fence around it. Below window level so the teachers inside won't spy on us the whole time. The ones on lunch duty mostly stay up top with the younger kids. By the time we got out there, Dave Calderon and Lulu Peters were already captains, choosing up sides for Salugi, 
the game I think we invented back in fourth grade. Basically, you have to get your goal without being thrown down, and then you have to get through the goal, which are these little spaces under the fence out there. The small kids are really good for that part because the bigger kids, like me and Dave and Evangeline Murphy, would never fit through those holes. So we are kind of good at grabbing the smaller kids' feet and not letting them through. Salugi has been officially banned ever since Evangeline gave Mike a bloody nose at it last year, but we play anyway. It's a really fun game, and a little collision with concrete never hurt anyone. Much. Well, at least not today. Lulu picked me, so Dave got Mike. Mike is a great guy and really smart at school, up there in the top group with Gabriella in every subject. I'm in all the same classes as them, except for math. I didn't do so well at it last year. My mom says it's okay to not be in the top group of math, but she's like that. I wish I were in that math class. But Mike, anyway, is a really nice guy, as well as being very smart. But he even admits himself he will never go pro in Salugi. We lined up in the center and started. It was a hot day, so I was sweating pretty soon. I love Salugi. The game was going really well. Lots of interceptions, well-balanced teams. Evangeline is really strong, so she forced a couple of fumbles in the first few minutes. But Lulu made a great catch and faked out Evangeline beautifully, then tossed the ball to me. I caught it and started toward the goal. Lulu sprinted ahead, and I saw her up there, wide to the right of the goal, just waiting to get the last second pass. I knew we were going to score. I could already see exactly how I'd block Dave away from Lulu's feet. I had maybe three of their defenders hanging on me, but I am strong, and I'd just eaten that really great sandwich. I could still taste the clean of the cucumbers blending with the smokiness of the turkey, so I was well energized. That's right. I focused on Lulu's feet. Just get those tiny white sandals with the yellow and purple flowers We'll be up one zip. That's what I was saying to myself when I tried to kick it up a notch. And dipping my right shoulder to try to lose one of the defenders, plowed smack into Gabriella Gonzalez. What she was doing in midfield, I have no idea. She is very small, one of the smallest of the small kids. So she should have been back by the other goal. In case somebody, somehow, got the ball away from me. But I have to say that the truth is, Gabriella is even worse at Smoogie than Mike. She kind of stands around until the action comes near her, <laughs> and then does this sort of skittering thing with her tiny steps to get away. This time, I guess she didn't quite make it. I hit her full force with my shoulder on the back. <laughs> Charlie, get out of here. Technical difficulty. Uh, let's see, where were we? We were smashing into Gabriella, if I remember correctly. She's very small, one of the smallest of the small kids. So she should have been backed by the other goal, in case somebody somehow got the ball away from me. But I have to say that the truth is, Gabriella is even worse at Salugi than Mike. She kind of stands around until the action comes near her, and then does this sort of skittering thing with her tiny steps to get away. This time, I guess she didn't quite make it. I hit her full force with my shoulder on her back. Still... I am not saying it is her fault or anything. I should have seen her there, near the sideline. I read somewhere that great ball players can see the entire field at all times. But I didn't see her at all until I'd already slammed into her. She went up for a while before she came down. It was sort of slow how she moved through the air, more like a balloon, not helium, than like a ball. When you smack it, and it but more like a ball when you smack it, it goes fast, but then almost puts on the brakes sort of takes its time, going up, 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 and then down, down, down. Like it's in no rush at all to get back to the ground. And why should it be? Gabriella, once she eventually did get back to the ground, looked sort of startled to find herself there, a few feet from where she'd been standing just a few seconds earlier. We all crowded around. I still had the ball tucked into the crook of my arm. You okay? People were asking. Gabriella? Oh no! Ew, look at her knee. We all looked at her knee, including Gabriella. One of them was fine, the other was not. It was split open. It wasn't bleeding much, but there was gook in it. It was a little horrible to see, honestly. Gabriella's face went from surprised and pink to incredibly white. She made a little sound in the back of her throat. I dropped the ball, and without really thinking it, without really thinking it through, picked her up. 
I didn't want her to faint right there on the lower playground. Time out, I mumbled as I carried her toward school. She rested her very white face against my shoulder and closed her eyes. I know this is very bad and selfish of me. When I should have been feeling more sympathetic about her bashed up leg, but her head on my sweaty t-shirt felt nice. Sorry, I whispered. First thing I ever said to her. Sorry. She didn't answer. You can't blame her, I thought. It's got to be hard to work up any politeness toward the guy who just crushed you, even if it was an accident, and he's sorry. I didn't say anything else, just carried her to the nurse's office. The nurse wasn't there. Some fourth grader lying on a cot with an ice pack on his ear said the nurse had gone to the teacher's room and would be right back. I wasn't sure what to do with Gabriella, where to put her. The fourth grade sore ear kid had closed his eyes, so he was definitely in no hurry to give, a, give up his cot spot. I wasn't sure if Gabriella would want to be put on one of the plastic chairs or not. She still had her head on my sweaty t-shirt, so I just stood there, holding her. She is very tiny, but my arms were starting to fall asleep. I had to shift around. Gabriella's eyes opened, and she stared right into my face. She seemed surprised to find me there. Um, I said, I liked your bugs that poop and dust thing. What? Project, report, I, I said. Science, today. A drop of my sweat fell onto her nose. I tried to wipe it away quickly, but I almost dropped her on the floor, moving my arm like that. She sort of yelped. I caught her. She wiped the sweat ball away from herself and asked, Dust my feces? I nodded slightly. I didn't want to shake any more sweat balls loose. It didn't gross you out? Gabriella asked. No, I whispered. She stared at me for a few seconds, then smiled and said, Thanks. I forgot I should say, you're welcome, until she closed her eyes and lowered her head onto my shoulder again, and by then it was too late. The nurse came back after another minute or so. She took one look at Gabriella's knee and said, uh-oh. I could feel Gabriella breathing faster, so when the nurse told me, you can put her down and go back to class, I said, that's okay. The nurse called Gabriella's mom, sent the ear boy back to class, and told me to lay Gabriella down on the cot. I shook my head. I ate a big lunch, I said, trying to explain why I wouldn't run out of strength. The nurse looked really confused, but I saw a small smile on Gabriella's mouth. She has such a sweet smile. She wasn't too heavy at all. I could have stood there in the nurse's office holding Gabriella Gonzalez until the end of time. And that was Rachel Vale's story. Charlie. Everybody have a nice little weekend coming up.